Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Bradbury. I'm one of the board members for the Northwest Science Writers Association. We're going to get started in about three or four minutes. We're just waiting for a few more people to, uh, to join us at uh, Northeastern University. In the meantime, feel free to uh, talk to each other in the chat, say where you're from, what you're working on, what you did today in the sun. Jared's going to start. Hello. Welcome. Hi, my name is Jaron Walker and I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Northeastern University here in Seattle. And I just want to start with saying it's hot and I'm so sorry. We are in one of the most LED certified buildings, which is lovely and glorious on the other 364 days of the year. Uh, but today happens to be one of the few days where we just get baked. So we, we really appreciate you kind of bearing with us. And, and again, we're just so excited to have you on campus. Uh, you know, we're, we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary next year. And I still think we're one of the best kept secrets in South Lake Union. Um, our graduate and professional studies programs house about 1,200 students here in South Lake Union, and we focus on specifically STEM programs and specifically with a focus on data analytics, project management, computer science, information systems, all those good things that we're hearing from our big local companies that they want to hire for. Um, as the, the Director of Strategic Partnerships, one of the big things that I'm keen to understand is also how our employers are thinking about upskilling their existing workforces. And in addition, I brought one of my colleagues with me in the back of the room who's focusing on some of our new research initiatives and specifically thinking about how we can help contribute to the biosciences and the life sciences ecosystem that exists here in, in Washington State. So with that, I will be brief. I will just say that, again, we're excited to have you and, and welcome virtually or in person. Look forward to talking more. Thanks, Jaren. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Ellen Kwana. I'm president of Northwest Science Writers this year, which is a tremendous honor. I really wanna thank Northeastern University. Um, they've been on my radar for a little bit, but and I've seen the building online, um, but never in person. So it's a thrill to be here. They are such gracious hosts. For those of you online, I'm sorry, you can't enjoy the, enjoy the refreshments. And they also provided us with journals, which every science writer loves. So thank you so, so much for that, Northeastern University. Um, I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Here in Seattle, we're on the ancestral territory of uh, native land on which we are working today. Um, its green spaces are unseated and on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, land acknowledgement is a way for us to 
acknowledge systemic oppression and through the words that we choose of speaking of these people in present language help to right some of the wrongs that have been in the past. Um, we shape the perceptions of our world through words we choose to use and through our actions and the, our words. We can remind ourselves that we need to remedy land, social and other injustices through our beliefs, actions and language. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Northwest Science Writers is one of the largest and oldest regional science writing groups in the United States. We have almost 300 members during the pandemic. So for the last two years, we've had a very special $1 price to join so that hopefully um, cost is no barrier. You can access the past recordings and then you get access to wonderful events um, such as this one, as well as you can sign up for a mentoring program. We also are offering career development awards. The information just went up on our website, I think today, um, that Award cycle closes August 1st. It's two awards up to $1,000 each. And all you have to do is write a very short um, paragraph about how what you're, you're asking us to fund will advance your career. There's no cost to apply. It's open to anybody at any stage in their career. It can be a virtual or an in-person training. Um, and so that's a really, really great um, perk that we offer of being a member. We also have some amazing events coming up. The next one will be Friday, August 5th. It's a book launch party for one of our members who has written a book called At Home on an Unruly Planet. It's gonna be in South Lake Union nearby at the collective. Um, so be sure to register for that and it's open to the public. Um, so now I wanna turn it over to Michael Bradbury, one of our board members who put this together and to introduce our panel. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen. Hi, everybody. So you want to write a book. That's what we're here to talk about tonight. There are so many ways to talk yourself out of not writing a book. In fact, it's easy to go down the road. Sorry, if you choose to go down the road of writing a book and having it released by a traditional publisher, then you're in the right place. I attended a publishing webinar during the early months of COVID and a book consultant there said there are three easy ways to talk yourself out of embarking on the long and arduous journey of writing a book. She said, you can tell yourself that self-publishing is the way to go, that you don't have a platform, or that publishing is dead. These are the things she hears from scared would-be authors all the time. But the reality is that a lot of books get bought and released every year. Before the pandemic, book publishing was undergoing explosive growth in spite of new hybrid and digital publishing options. In fact, literary agent Liza Dawson offers some hope to writers considering writing a book. She says agents love new writers. Why? Because they have no bad sales figures. There is endless potential and agents thrive on the drama of discovery. She says there is nothing more enticing than a debut author. And we have two of them with us tonight. We also have a couple of folks who've been around the publishing block a few times. So let me introduce our panel. Sandy Doughton is an award-winning science writer and writer for the Seattle Times. She started her career over 20 years ago at the Los Alamos Monitor in New Mexico. She jumped over to the Tacoma News Tribune and then landed as science reporter at the Seattle Times. She is the author of Full Rip 9.0, The Next Big Earthquake in the Pacific Northwest, which was published by Sasquatch Books in 2013 and her other book, Becoming a Midwife, which was published in 2020 by Simon & Schuster, now the parent of Sasquatch Books. We also have Rebecca Heinemann behind me on the screen live from Walla Walla, Washington. Rebecca loves birds and she loves writing. She has written and done other communications work for, communi for organizations, including the Audubon Society, American Bird Conservancy, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the Wilson Ornithological Society, that's a mouthful, and the American Ornithological Society. Her first book called Flight Paths, which is due out from Harper Collins in spring of 2023, tells the epic scientific story of how we know what we know about bird migration. Next, we have Bryn Nelson over on the end here. Bryn is a freelance writer and editor who covers biology, biomedicine, ecology, green technology, and unconventional travel destinations. He received his PhD in microbiology from the University of Washington and a graduate certificate in science writing from UC Santa Cruz. He was on the science desk at Newsday for seven years before going freelance where he won many awards. 
And he's now the author of Flush, The Remarkable Science of an Unlikely Treasure, which is coming out September 13th by Grand Central Publishing, an imprint of Hachette Book Group. Finally, we have Steve Olson, who is an definitely undaunted by writing books. He's the author of five of them, including The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age by W.W. W. Norton and Company, which came out in 2020, Eruption, Untold Story of Mount St. Helens by W.W. W. Norton and Company in 2017, Anarchy Revolution, Faith, Science, and Bad Religion in a World Without God, W.W. W. Norton and Company 2011, Countdown, The Race for Beautiful Solutions at the International Mathematical Olympiad, Mariner Books 2005, and Mapping Human History, Genes, Race, and Our Common Origin, Mar Mariner Books 2003. He has also written for the Atlantic Monthly, Science, the Smithsonian, and many other magazines. Since 1979, he has also been a consultant for the uh, National Academy of Sciences, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and other national scientific organizations. So that's who our panel is. Now I'd like them to please introduce themselves by sharing their best piece of advice for someone who's thinking about writing a book. And Sandy, we'll start with you. Where's the camera? It's like we're talking to people at home, it's up there. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you all for, for coming and thanks for inviting me to participate. I think when, when I set out to write my first book, which was the earthquake book about earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest, I was really freaked out. And I thought there's no way I can write a book. It's just such a daunting, um, uh, the, the prospect was just so daunting. And the only way I got over that was to think about it in, in terms of bite-sized pieces. So thinking about what, you know, what I do know how to do is to write a newspaper article. And I can write long newspaper articles. I've done a lot of that. So that's the way I tamed my panic, I guess, was just to just think about every chapter as a really long newspaper story. And um, to me, that's the only way I can do it, just to break it down into chunks, things that you already know how to do. Rebecca, you can hear me, right? Uh, you were a little bit quieter there, but were you asking me to go next or? Okay. Um, that's funny because I told myself something really similar when I was starting my book. I just have to write 10 interconnected magazine features. That's all it is. But um, my piece of advice that I was going to go with would be if you can to get one or more successful book proposals of books kind of similar to the one you want to write so that when you start writing your proposal, you have a model to work from. Uh, very kind acquisitions editor shared a couple book proposals with me when I was just starting out and that was invaluable. Well, writing a book is a, a very long process. Uh, I, I usually calculate it takes me between two and 3,000 hours of work to write a book, maybe 3,000 or 4,000 hours altogether. So even if you have a decent advance, it's going to run out pretty quickly, especially by the time you start paying for research assistance and artwork and travel and give 15% to your agent and so on and so forth. So I've always tried to investigate sources of support at, at early stages in the writing of a book, both monetary support and oh, workshops or uh, communities of writers that may be able to help you out along the way. I haven't always been completely successful at that, but as I've read, written through these five books that I've written, it's become more and more important to try to find that support. And it's helped me more and more from just pretty much going it alone in the initial stages to having a, a, a bit more of a collaborative approach to some of the book writing toward the end. Hi, um, so I guess my advice would be, uh, this was an idea that I had sort of rolling around in my head since 2014. And I think, um, one of the ways that I knew that this was something that I really wanted to do rather than just another long feature story was that I would obsessed enough about it that I would talk 
uh, at parties <laughs> about it. Um, and I had uh, several folders that I would collect uh, uh, stories, um, articles, and that. So kind of like collecting string for it. And I think what kind of helped me put it together is thinking about my elevator pitch. Like, how does it all hang together? Like, what's the central argument? And then you can kind of break that down into chapters. And it's easier than to kind of parcel out your collection that you have your little junk drawer of ideas and say, this belongs here, this belongs here. And it helps, I think a little bit um, getting past the kind of imposter syndrome of like, uh, you know, why me, why this? And I think getting that confidence and um, understanding that you really do have an interesting idea and you've already done some of the work in trying to organize it and put it together. I think that really kind of helps from the start. Okay, so kind of uh, dovetailing off of that question, uh, what do you wish you'd known about writing a book before writing a book, i.e., what information do you wish you had that you're going to give all of these wonderful people? We'll start with you, Bryn. Well, I guess, I guess financially, one of the things that I wish that I had known before was that your advance isn't really in advance. Um, and now um, a lot of publishers, uh, they used to divide the advance into three parts, and now it's divided into four parts, um, usually. And so what that means is that the number that uh, they give you is in your, as your advance, 15% goes to your agent, and then it's divided four ways. So you really only have like a fourth of that uh, as your income when you're actually working on your book because you get the first part when you sign, you get the second part of that when you deliver the finished manuscript. The third part is when you actually publish. And then the fourth part is when the paperback comes out, which can be a year afterwards. So it's quite spread out. So I think that knowing that um, more in advance would have helped me, I guess, sort of chart out financially how this was gonna work. In thinking about this question, I considered those five books of mine, and I realized that the advice I would offer is try not to be too ambitious in choosing a subject to write about. And I say that from hard experience. My first book, Mapping Human History, was written in the early days of genetic anthropology. And so I said, well, I will just take this emerging information, mostly from mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome, and sort of reconstruct all of human history on the basis of that. I'll tell the, tell the story of the past 100,000 years of human history. That was a mistake, I'd say. <laughs> that, that book did well and was interesting. But for instance, when you have a whole chapter on the origins and evolution of language over time, you have, you have to do a tremendous amount of research. So then my next three books, the middle book was actually co-written with someone else. And if anyone's interested in the co-writing process, I can talk a little bit about that. I co-wrote that book with the lead singer of the punk band, Bad Religion, who's a, uh, a lecturer at Cornell. So I, I, the second, third, and fourth books went fine. And then in the fifth book, I decided what I would do is tell the whole story of the atomic age as reflected in the title of that book through the lens of, of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. I grew up in a, a small town just 15 miles away from Hanford in Eastern Washington. That too turned out to be a mistake because so much has been written about not only the Manhattan Project, but everything subsequent to the Manhattan Project, the Cold War, the cleanup, the environmental problems, the health effects of the downwinders. And I essentially had to read, if not all of that, a significant portion of it. I had these huge stacks of boxes filled with books that I had to have, at least have some familiarity with in trying to retell that whole story from the invention of the neutron in 1930, the discovery of the neutron in 1930 to, to the modern age. So that would be my one piece of advice. The, the, writing those two books was really a hair pulling experience because I, I, I bit off more than I could chew. Well, I, I, I would say that, um... If I had known how little guidance and how little editing I would I was going to get, I would have um, reached out more to my friends, to to you know colleagues, writers I admire for really substantive 
um, comments on my book because, you know, honestly, it felt like I got uh, on both of them less editing than I would get on a big uh, newspaper or magazine piece. So if you go in thinking your editor is going to hold your hand and guide you, maybe that happens, but it sure didn't happen to me. It was like, you know, I was I was pretty much entirely on my own. I remember the one, you know, time with my first editor at uh, Sasquatch, this guy named Gary Luke, you know, I had said I would do the book and then, you know, I just got myself into a tizzy where I thought I just can't possibly do this. I don't know. You know, I was hyperventilating and I went to him to meet with him and he was, he was like, he had nothing to say to me. He had no advice. He, you know, he didn't even say anything to calm me down. So uh, understand that you're going to be on your own. And if you want good um, comments, turn to turn to other writers that you admire. Hey, Rebecca. Yeah, I also was shocked at how little editing my editor actually did when I finally turned in my whole manuscript. And along with that, the first thing that popped into my mind with this was I wish I had known a lot more about photos and how photo permissions work. I am not a copyright expert and my publisher seemed surprised when I asked if they had like a template photo release form or something that I could use to have people sign for photos. They, they seemed baffled as to why I would need such a thing, even though of course the author is completely the one on the hook for figuring out all the photos and photo permissions. So I wish I had known a lot more about how photo permissions and copyright work ahead of time. Great, thank you. Well, as most of you know, we are holding this hybrid event in a new world where some people are here with us and others are online. So hello to everyone out there. Uh, please use the Q&A box to send in your questions. Someone is monitoring them and we'll try to get to some of those at the end. Um, unfortunately, the COVID pandemic is far from over, yet people are still writing books. So let's talk about how to write during COVID. Both Bryn and Rebecca had the opportunity, we'll say, to do that. So I'd like both of them to tell us what it was like and how it affected their reporting and the overall scope of the book. And we'll go ahead and start with you, Rebecca. Um, it certainly affected some of the decisions I made about the travel that I did. I ended up making, I would have to stop and count now. I made several, several domestic trips, some within driving distance of my house and a couple flying for research for the book. And I don't know that I would have done more travel if it worked for the pandemic, but I definitely early on when I was first selecting where I wanted to go, I didn't want to, I didn't, I, I wasn't ready to get on a plane yet. And so I, there were one or two projects that I didn't visit simply because the timeline of when the field work was happening was, was very soon and it was too far to drive. And I didn't feel like getting on a plane quite yet. Later, I did get on a plane to do some, to do some research trips, but there were a few projects that I might've gotten into the field to see that I skipped because of being a little leery of traveling so soon in the pandemic. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. I mean, even um, when we were, I guess, interviewing with publishers, that was all on Zoom, um, you know, and I was still learning Zoom. Um, and yeah, I think at one point my knees were shaking, but they couldn't see my knees. So it was just, um, it was a little surreal. Um, I had initially intended to go to Europe um, and possibly Africa as well on reporting trips. Um, that didn't happen. Um, so there were a lot of Zoom calls uh, with sources. Um, I actually relied on some of my uh, previous reporting. And I would say one tip would be, you know, even if you're going on vacation or you're going to other conferences, always bring uh, you know, extra notebooks and think about opportunities to do reporting there because you never know when. They, that might come in handy. And I actually uh, used uh, reporting from, you know, multiple past uh, trips that worked really well uh, for what I wanted it for. And I think the other thing um, serendipitously is uh, there was a lot of wastewater uh, epidemiology during COVID. And so I was actually able to do quite a bit of reporting on that. Um, and because I couldn't, and 
didn't feel comfortable uh, traveling. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I could get to in the Pacific Northwest. So there was actually a lot more reporting in my book, I think, than there would have been otherwise about uh, things in the Seattle, Tacoma, Portland uh, regions. Um, and, you know, uh, following a team in Tacoma as they were doing wastewater epidemiology, you know, I think really was you know, I, I, I would have had that in the book. I'm not sure that I would have had the same kind of experience. So so that was actually a, a, a plus, unexpectedly. Okay, well, let's get to the heart of the matter. How do you choose a topic that people want to read? Steve, we'll start with you. That probably depends to some extent on an issue we could talk about at greater length, which is whether or not you're going through an agent. In, in my case, I had an agent from my very first book. He had actually represented my wife on a book. And she said, well, you took, take a look at uh, something my husband wants to do. And agents hate that. They never don't like to look at the proposals offered by relatives. But it, it all worked out fine in the end with this particular book. And he was always the gatekeeper for ideas. So I, I could generate a lot of ideas and I would take them to him. And agents have very different philosophies of the way they're going to approach a book. Some are only interested in books for which they can acquire fairly large advances. My agent falls into that category. So he just wasn't interested in ideas for which he, that he couldn't sell to a New York publisher. Uh, at times, he would bring ideas to me as well. He would say, I have this idea. For instance, he, he thought, why don't you write a book about chance, about uh, the, the role that chance plays in our life? And I, it just was not something that I felt was compelling enough for me to want to spend three or 4,000 hours doing that. So, so I would reject some of his ideas as well. So that's the, that, that's the dynamic that I worked with. Now, I think it's quite different when you are not working with an agent and, and again, we can have a larger discussion about that. So who wants to go next? Well, my, my situation was really kind of unique for both of my books in that they both fell into my lap. So they were not uh, subjects that I chose. They were subjects that uh, publishers reached out to me and asked me to write about, um, which is, you know, nice i guess <laughs> to have to have that happen uh the the first one i got a solicitation from an email from gary luke at sasquatch books and he said um i'm interested in having i think it's about time to write a a book to have a book about earthquakes in the pacific northwest are you interested and that was it you know like two or three sentences um and i and i met with him um and i the more i talked about it you know my first response was no, no way. I don't want to write a book. That's a lot of work. Um, but I met with him and, and it was a subject that I was very interested in. I did feel it was very important. I had done a lot of reporting on it um, in, my, in my newspaper work. I felt that it wasn't being taken seriously enough. So I was very eager to, to do it. This, the second book kind of, it's, it's uh, called Becoming a Midwife. And once again, I just got an email from um, a young woman who worked at Simon & Schuster, and she happened to be from Seattle. So she had seen some of my work in the Seattle Times. And out of the blue, she said, you know, she emailed me and said they had this series of books about different careers. And, you know, it was the brainchild of the publisher whose daughter was interested in some career. And when she went to find out what it would really be like to do that job, she couldn't find anything. So they commissioned this series of books, kind of narrative driven books about different professions. And would I like to write one about midwifery? Well, you know, I've not had a child. Um, I'd never known a midwife, but they offered me $30,000. And it was half as long as my other book. So I said, sure. Um, so my idea actually came from uh, the uh, an article that I did for a magazine called Mosaic, a British magazine, and it was on uh, the rise of fecal transplants. And um, it actually, uh, you know, did well in that there was a lot of attention in the UK about it. And so that kind of got me thinking like, okay, well, maybe people are interested in this. 
And I would talk to some people and they would be, ooh, gross, tell me more, you know? And so I thought, well, that's an interesting challenge. Is there a way in that I can use humor or even disgust as a way to talk about some other issues? And so that kind of got me thinking more. And, and so I think it's a, you know, it's, it's certainly a quirky topic. And um, uh, as I discovered when I was uh, reaching out to agents, some of them were so disgusted that they, <laughs> They either didn't get back to me or they told they they told me in great detail how disgusted they were. <laughs> which was which was interesting that they, you know, bothered to spend that much time and energy. Um, but but what was interesting on the flip side is that it, there was this kind of sense of curiosity that that people had. And I think that kind of encouraged me to kind of keep going and think like, how can I you know, how can I use this as a vehicle for, for talking about larger issues? Um, so that's how it's, that's how it started. Well, I have always been a bird person and always been interested in writing and thought it might be great to write a book someday, but there's been a, there's, there's been a lot of really beautiful, wonderful, popular science books written about birds already. So the question was, if I was going to write a bird book someday, what would my book be that was different? And prior to the pandemic, I was working for the American Ornithological Society, which is the big professional society for bird scientists in North America as their communications person, uh, which entailed, among other things, writing a lot of press releases for work being published in their journals. And I had thought when I took that job that I was pretty knowledgeable about birds and bird research. So I was surprised when I was writing these paper, writing press releases, explaining these papers about people studying bird migration with weather radar and people studying bird migration by analyzing isotopes and bird feathers. And I'd never heard of any of this and started to dawn on me that that might make a good topic for a book, all of the different methods that scientists use to study this stuff and how we figured it out and the science behind them. And so when I ended up leaving that job at the start of the pandemic, I decided to go for it and write a book proposal. And in my case, I just lucked out with the timing because birds and bird watching kind of had a moment during the pandemic. And so I think there were agents and publishers interested in bird content. And so I was able to, to it worked out well that it was a topic that there was an audience for. That's great. Okay, so I'm gonna combine a couple of questions. As you know, when you uh, signed on to, to join us tonight, you were asked if you'd like to submit a question. So many of the questions that I'm asking are actually coming from you, the audience. I added a few of my own, and then we had a discussion among the panel. So we have a, a nice uh, variety of questions. So I'm gonna combine, combine these two. Is there a test that uh, allows you to decide if a book is, or a topic is worthy of a whole book and not just a magazine piece? And once you do decide that it is book worthy, how do you turn that into a real breathing project? Rebecca, do you want to start? Um, I liked the analogy from the beginning about thinking of it as a bunch of different interconnected newspaper pieces or magazine pieces. Um, boy, I don't know if there's a test that you can take to decide if your ideal will work as a book versus a magazine feature. I think I, I knew that my idea very early on was sort of to do a, a chapter per topic. And so that I knew that I had enough of these methods that I could probably fill out a whole book just by devoting a chapter to each one. And I was pretty sure that if I went into the history of the science behind how they work and how they were developed, then each one would fill up a chapter on its own. And so it just kind of went from there. And then as far as how to turn it into a living, breathing project, like I said, the thing that really got me started was an acquisitions editor who I connected with via Twitter was kind enough to send me multiple successful proposals that he had worked on so that I could kind of model it after that. And that got me rolling. Well, since neither neither of my books were subjects that I or gen generated myself, somebody else made that determination, I guess, that they that they were book worthy. But for me, the with the earthquake um, book, it was a uh, a slam dunk because I was constantly frustrated in writing about these things for the newspaper and how, you know, how short I had to make my pieces and, you know, how you couldn't uh, kind of build on, you know, this, this building story of research and discovery. So, so it was pretty clear that that was worth a book. In thinking about this question just now, I asked myself, could any of my five books have been reduced to magazine articles? In other words, could I conceive of them as magazine articles? And, and definitely not. 
that that would not have worked. They were all much bigger topics that needed to be treated at book length. But I would observe that with my first book, it really grew out of a magazine article. And that magazine article formed two or three of the 14 or 15 chapters in the book. And, and that was something that treated just the genetic history of Europe for the most part. And I said to myself, well, a book would be to tell this story for the whole world. And having that magazine article in hand was a great help in selling that book, both with the agent, because that was my first book, so I needed to convince him to represent me. And then when he took it out to Houghton Mifflin, in that case, published that book. And having that magazine article in hand was, was, was a big selling point for both the proposal and the book. I would say what really helped me was, you know, developing the the, the elevator pitch and uh, for the book and, you know, seeing whether people were interested enough to ask me more questions or, you know, if it was at a party, they wanted to excuse themselves and get another drink. Uh, and generally speaking, most people wanted to hear more. So that, I guess that was a good thing. Um, outlining uh, really, really, really helped me, um, but also not only to to figure out like what worked, but also what didn't. And uh, what I realized through outlining was that the magazine piece that I did uh, was actually uh, formed the seeds of three separate chapters um, uh, because I wanted to explore more of the history um, and because disgust was so central to a lot of the book, I actually did a separate chapter all about the uh, evolution of disgust and kind of how it factored into, um, you know, uh, doctors uh, not wanting to do fecal transplants. But then it came back again in other chapters, uh, water reclamation, you know, other other things, uh, biosolids, you know, turned into fertilizer. So, so it actually ended up being that that was kind of like the basis for the rest of the book. You know, what is it? Why are we disgusted by it? And that all came from um, this one article and thinking about, okay, what goes where? And how can I tell this story so that it builds? And so that made me really excited. Like, okay, maybe there is something more here. Okay, well, this whole process starts with a proposal. To get an agent, to get a publisher in a traditional sense, you have to write a proposal. For nonfiction, you write a proposal fiction, you write the whole manuscript and shop that around. So one of our questions, well, actually several different people ask the question similarly, which is, how do you write a proposal? So I'll add a little bit to that by saying or asking, uh, what resources did you use to write your proposal? And feel free to cite specific books, blogs, etc. Start with Steve. Hmm, I'm probably the worst person to start with because my answer is so nebulous because I can hardly remember. My agent required me to rewrite the proposal so many times. In contrast to, the, to an earlier, when, when you were saying, Sandy, you didn't get much editing, I did get a lot of editing, both on the proposal and when I turned the book into all of my editors. They, they did both line editing and substantive editing to the book. And that was hard. So the proposal was this constantly evolving thing. And of course, revising something is always difficult, but it almost always, 99.9% .9 of the time, makes something better. And so if, if I didn't have that, I would have needed some other way to get that kind of feedback to work on the proposal and get it to the point that it needed to be at. Yeah, I actually um, received a lot of feedback from my agent uh, first on the proposal. I mean, I guess even to land an agent, um, you know, a lot of times you have to put out the, 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 the overview and, you know, a, a type of proposal, I guess, you know, it will often look quite different by the time you're ready to, uh, uh, shop it around to, to, uh, publishing houses. Uh, but in that case, um, I went to a narrative conference, a narrative journalism conference at Cal. And so there was actually a workshop on developing, uh, pitches, uh, for, uh, to, for agents. And that's kind of the seed of your proposal, right? Because you have to do, um, sort of like a, uh, you know, one and a half to three page kind of, this is your overview. This is, this is, you know, why you, why now? Um, 
And we worked on, when I landed my agent, we worked on a proposal for eight months. Um, and we went through a lot of versions of it. Uh, we added a chapter, we cut a couple chapters, we reshuffled them. Um, so it was a it was a pretty substantive thing, but I think one of one of the other things I would I would add is that uh, they're really looking for the connective glue. You know, we talked about kind of that you can think of this in a way as as you know ten different uh, feature stories, but there has to be sort of the thread between them and the sense that they're building towards something. And initially, I didn't have that, and so my agent was sort of adamant of like. You know, getting me to think about where are you going with this, um, and so part of that was the order of the chapters, um, but then also kind of the argument that I was making and the idea that I could be a little sharper with my argument in a book because it's not just an article. So that helped quite a bit. Rebecca, I mean, I already shared a couple of times that I was very fortunate that I had a book proposal, actually a couple of book proposals to work from and model mine after, and I think that made an enormous amount of difference. Uh, to the extent that when I signed with an agent, she actually had very little additional work that she asked me to do on the proposal. We, I went from signing with an agent to actually shopping it around to publishers very quickly. So I realize not everyone has access to that resource, but I think if you look online, there are also a lot of examples of like, here's what should go into a book proposal. Here's the parts, here's how you should approach each one. It's basically a couple sample chapters and an outline of the rest of it and a few other sections, so. Well, again, my situation was so unusual for the midwifery book. I didn't have to write a proposal at all because it just kind of, it's the, these, the books in this series kind of follow not exactly a formula, but you're just like a narrative spending time with someone doing this particular profession for the earthquake book. I, you know, I wrote a couple pages just kind of based on my previous reporting and, and remember though, I'm working without an agent. So that's a totally different um, situation. And maybe I would have made more money if I had an agent. <laughs> Great. Are there any uh, questions in the room about proposal writing specifically? Any online? Yes. Hi, um, I have a question about the pitch for an agent. So the proposal is not for an agent, right? You have to pitch an agent first. What does that look like? How do you do that? I, I could address this since I did it pretty recently, if that's okay. Um, so you, you do write the proposal before you start querying agents, but you don't then immediately send your whole proposal to an agent. You send an email sort of summarizing your book in a few paragraphs and saying, do you wanna see my whole proposal? And if you're lucky, then they'll say yes. And if you're very lucky, then they'll read your proposal and say they wanna sign you. But you do have the proposal written before you start talking to agents, or at least that was my experience. Yes, what she said. But also uh, one, one, one thing that is, um, you know, your, the, the product that you send to an agent, yeah, may look vastly different from what you end up sending to, uh, to a publisher. Uh, but they're going to be probably hooked the most by the first two to three pages, which is your overview. You know, they also want to see how you can write, you know, so that the, sam the sample chapter is good and, you know, does this hang together. But I, I think, you know, most agents are so overwhelmed that, and they get so many submissions that they can pretty quickly tell whether it's something they would go for or not. And that's usually within the first page or two. Yeah. And then as, as has been mentioned, they'll help you shape it. An agent will help you shape your proposal further to kind of make it as good as it can be before they shop it around to publishers. And a lot of agents do have a page on their website or at least a paragraph that, that says what they're looking for, including yeah. my agent. He gets lots and lots of, of pitches, essentially. And, and uh, if you go to his website, website, he says what it is that he wants you to send him as a pitch. Are there any more online questions related to pitching, querying agents? Could you talk a little bit more about ideas for finding funding or how somebody would even search for those or if they're ones that you know of that I, I there was one 
Well, I guess that was the the conference, but specifically for funding or fellowships, could you talk about that a little bit? We're actually going to get to that in just a little bit related to actually writing the book, but is there any funding sources that you guys have come across in terms of uh, before you write the book to write a proposal or to work with an agent? Just on the way walking down here, I was thinking about this. I, I'm on the Speakers Bureau for uh, Humanities Washington. It's a two-year gig, and uh, it's a group of maybe 30 or 40 people who essentially uh, write proposals for the organization Humanities Washington uh, about topics that they're interested in and, and that they want to uh, be able to go out and give talks on. Now, some of us have written books, and we're sort of using this as a way to promote our books, but other people just have really fascinating things that they've been working on. Each one of those talks generates an honorarium. And for someone interested in writing a book, this is just a, you know, I think there are lots of opportunities like this. You could try to join that Speakers Bureau because a lot of people are sort of in the pre-book writing phase and take it on the road and you'll modify your, you'll work on your ideas, you'll work on a talk, you'll have PowerPoint slides. There are a lot of those talks that I've watched that could easily be translated into books. And so that's one opportunity. You know, the other thing people should remember if, um, is that we are science writers and the Sloan Foundation has a public understanding of a science program. And for many, many years, decades at this point, they have been providing grants to writers, uh, sizable grants for that matter. Uh, you don't always get them, but it is well worth applying in almost every case because it's a very sort of idiosyncratic program in which if the program director sees something he likes, he's going to provide you with some money to, provide, to write that book. And Sometimes it can be as large or larger than your advance for that matter. So anyway, just two ideas, but I actually think there are quite a few different opportunities out there that uh, that I have probably not been good enough at exploring with previous books, but that I'm, I'm finally starting to realize I should have done all along. Great, thank you. Uh, so nobody really had any trouble securing an agent, did they? Rin, did you struggle a little bit? Oh, I guess one 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 caution is that sometimes agents will approach you out of the blue, and um, I would just urge people to be really cautious about that and do your homework. Um, I had an agent that did that, and it was actually a different feature story that I had written for Mosaic on iPain, and I wasn't interested in writing a book about it. That was one of those cases where I knew now this is a this is a magazine feature, not a not a book. Um, but we talked and he said and I said well I actually have this other idea for a book and then he was immediately excited and I think I should have maybe had a little bit more of the red flags going off because he was sort of like excited about like everything but there wasn't a lot of substance to the criticism um and in yeah so just to make a long story short um you know he ended up ghosting me um after a while and so I start over. I started over again, and uh, this time went and used the publisher's marketplace website, um, which a friend, Michael, <laughs> introduced me to, uh, which was great because you know it, it requires work, and you might have to do an Excel spreadsheet. But basically, you can look at all of the agents who have dealt with science books. And you can use criteria, you know, who has sold one or two science related books in the past, you know, 12 months or 18 months um, to get a sense that they're active, you know, in that space. And, and you just go down the list and, you know, then you just start pitching. And it took about two months of pitching. So I think I had about like two dozen pitches that I had sent out. Um, before I got some hits, I got a little, a few nibbles. Um, so, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I think two months wasn't too bad. And uh, I'm interested in Rebecca's, Rebecca's been through this as well. I will say that it is hard to get an agent who's going to really help your career. They get lots of, lots of ideas. So one thing I recommend to people who are at that phase of their writing career is to go to conferences. The Pacific Northwest Writers Association, so not the science writers, but the broader group of writers here in the Pacific Northwest has an annual conference. 
And there are lots of agents that come to those conferences and you get to do interesting things like pitch slams where you sit down with a, a sequence of agents and, and provide your ideas and the agent says good idea or bad idea and gives you some ideas to correct it. And I think you can also just pick up a lot of information about the agents who are there and the agents that you might want to try to find. But let's see what Rebecca has said. Yeah, the one thing I would add is that if you're trying to build your list of agents to query, another place to look is that if there are recent books that you like and that are in a similar vein to yours, look at the acknowledgments and see if they say who their agent is. Um, that's actually how I signed with mine. I use, I did use the web sign up for Publishers Marketplace to start building my list of people to query, but I happened to be reading a book about the natural history of butterflies and sort of the history of people's fascination with butterflies and flip to the acknowledgements. And it's like, well, that's interesting. I'll look that agent up and add that person to my list. And that's who ended up signing me. So it's another, another way to find people to contact. And just, and just to add to that, one of the things like reading the books that uh, may fit in kind of the overall sense of what you want to do, not necessarily books that are on the same subject, but yeah. books that have the sort of the same sensibility, um, because what when I landed my agent, um, all of her authors kind of have like the same sort of set, you know, ones on like the history of surgery in Victorian England, you know, which is quirky and odd, but, you know, there's a larger point. So, so there, there, there I kind of felt like I fit in with like all of her other authors yeah. and she spent a lot of time telling me like what her philosophy was. And that was a moment where I was like, oh, this is a good fit. Uh, so that's another, another tip. Add something to you. Um, yeah, so a couple of people mentioned Publishers Marketplace. That's a very valuable tool. Um, and like Bryn said, that you can search for agents in any category. You can throw in uh, keywords. You can see what deals specific agents have sold over the course of time. And uh, there's coded language in there. Uh, according to uh, an insider that I spoke with, uh, these are the deal levels. <laughs> there's something called a nice deal which is under $50,000. And we're talking about advances here. There's a very nice deal, which is 50,000 to $100,000. A good deal, 100 to $250,000. A significant deal, 250,000 to $500,000. And a major deal, which is over $500,000. So before we talk about uh, each of your advances, and <laughs> Sandy gave us a little hint earlier, um, <laughs> Having an agent is very important, not just because they're the ones who are going to broker the deal because you guys are not, you know, wheelers and dealers, you're writers. Um, what was the point where you actually really appreciated your agent? Was it when they got you the deal or was there something else? Sandy? No agent. As I say, my agent was always interested in larger advances, although I never substantial or major. <laughs> Very nice and good was the, the limits of my experience. And, and my career would have been quite, I think, I think my book writing career would have been different if I'd had a different agent, if I'd had someone who was less interested in making sure that the advance made it worth his while and my while. I probably would have written more books on on perhaps less momentous subjects. And so that's another thing for people to think about if they want to write more than one book and want to have a sequence of books, sort of look at your agent's experience and ask yourself that question of whether you want to write a lot of books or whether you want to write relatively few and how you may be able to work with that particular agent on that reflection. Uh, well, I debated a little bit at first whether to even attempt to query agents, because if you're going to go through like a smaller publishing house, like a, a small press or a university press, you don't necessarily need an agent. And I had actually had a couple acquisitions editors at university presses approach me about my book proposal when I was still working on it, because I posted a lot about it on social media. But I ended up I ended up deciding to go for it, and I was glad that I did. Um, my agent scares me a little bit. I couldn't do what she does for a living when she was like playing off potential publishers against each other and kind of going through this whole intense book selling process. I was like, wow, I could not, I could not do any of this. Um, and it it paid off because I did end up signing with a large publisher, and I am in the I am in the good range of the publishers marketplace categories as far as where my advance landed. Um, 
I really have probably, uh, uh, I have a great relationship with my agent. And I think the, the first time that I really um, appreciated her was this kind of insistence for, you know, the connective glue and her actually being able to spot an argument within, you know, the, the chapter summary. And she would say that, that's it. And that's what I want more of. And, you know, here's how I think it might connect with this. And do you, do you agree or not? So we have, would have a discussion on that. But she spent a lot of time and energy uh, working with me on the proposal. And, and so, you know, when it came time to, uh, to shop it around, she also prepared me on the um, editors. And, you know, here's uh, what I think this editor is going to want to know. Here's a question that you're going to have to be prepared for. So, you know, as nerve wracking as it was, I felt like I was really well prepared by her. And that was something I never would have been able to do on my own. So, yeah. Yeah. Really appreciate her. So, Sandy, do you want to talk very briefly about not having an agent and what the experience has been like for you? When when I got that first email from the editor at Sasquatch asking if I wanted to write a book about earthquakes, um, as as I said, first of all, I didn't want to write a book about earthquakes. Um, but then I got to thinking about it, and I was interested enough in the in the subject. And I had, you know, Sasquatch is a small re regional press. Um, I had no idea um, what kind of money we would be talking about. And the first offer they made to me was $7,000 to write a 60,000 word book. And, you know, I didn't know any better, um, but I got to thinking about it. Um, and a, I went back in and I asked for 15,000, which I thought was a whole lot of money. Um, and, you know, I don't know if they even deal with agents, if I had had an agent, if they would have been able to, to pay me more than that. Uh, but what I wound up getting was $12,000. So for me, it was a huge uh, money losing experience because I took six months off of work. And then I worked part time for another <laughs> three months and uh, it did not, it did not balance out. Um, for the, for the midwifery book, I don't really think I, my impression was that that's what they were paying for those books that they were paying everybody the same so i don't think an agent would have made a difference but i'm not positive okay so does anyone else want to disclose their advances specifically okay bryn ninety thousand. I think my first advance as is typical with uh, with early writers in fact because you don't have a sales record you can't get a larger advance so this was back in 1998 that would have been around a hundred and then for my second book which sold extremely poorly but was really an interesting book I think I might have gotten 125 and that's in the early 2000s my more recent advances have been 75,000 and 80,000 so the number even over the course of 20 years has gone down I'm, I'm sheepish to admit to, I'm sheepish to admit this and it was largely a matter of right place right time but mine was one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. Congratulations. So it is you, possible. Don't be sheepish be proud. <laughs> there need to be more of us like that. Okay, so now you've closed the deal your agent has helped you secure your uh, your advance. Now what, where do you begin organizing your book research reporting pacing the book, the writing process, et cetera, and how do you juggle that with other paid work? Um, so I guess for the organization question, um, I, I thought about Scrivener, um, but I was kind of freaked out um, and I didn't want to try and have to learn something else. Um, so I went with what I knew, which was nested folders. So I used a lot of color coding and folders within folders. Um, and that worked for me. Um, and the one thing that I wish I would have done more is to be really, really, really fastidious about uh, footnotes from the beginning. Because uh, I can't tell you how many times I had to go back and try and figure out oh, where have I found it? Where did I get this? fact, um, even though I thought I was being really good about it. So that 
you know, I can't stress that enough because it will just make you tear your hair out. Um, the other thing is I dropped most of my gigs and I kept the ones that were the highest paying, the highest paying and the least pain in the ass. Um, so because I didn't want to have to use a lot of, of my mental <laughs> capacity on the other projects that I was working on, because it really was, I mean, there was a lot of reading of research papers, you know, um, uh, you know, several dozen books. Um, so there's a lot of, of mental energy that goes into it. And so that was a calculus of how can I keep part of my salary um, so that, you know, I can help pay the bills. Uh, you know, it helps that if you have a partner, you know, who's also working full time, who can help you, you know, through that. Um, but yeah, that was the, that was the calculation. So I, I kept two clients. And so I probably worked on the book, maybe two thirds of the time, uh, to 75% of the time, just to keep some other money coming in. Uh, yes, I, I too use folders and boxes. I probably had 300 books uh, organized by boxes. I'd have a couple boxes on Nagasaki and so on and so forth. Uh, that, that's really a good advice to try and keep track of your footnotes. Another thing you might think about as you're going through this process is you're going to eventually be writing an acknowledgments page and you're going to want to thank those librarians who gave you a hand. And so that's another good file to keep handy because it's it's hard to write that acknowledgments page at the end if you don't already have that information right at hand. And as far as when my projects got done, I had to I had to keep doing work to to support it. So my wife watched a lot of PBS shows while I read books about the Manhattan Project in the evenings. That's how we did it. Well, for the for my for my earthquake book, as I said, I took six months off of of, of work, and I still wasn't finished when I came back. So I worked part time for about three months to to finish that up. Um, with the midwifery book, yeah, I'd learned my lesson that I wasn't going to take time off from work. Um, and so I just did that while I was working, and I was fortunately able to um, piggyback a story for the Seattle Times Sunday Magazine on midwifery, which incorporated um, several several aspects and characters who who were in the book. So I was able to do some, you know, reporting for the book on company time, but all all the rest of it I did on my own. And, and in terms of organizing, I wish I had done it better, <laughs> but I did use. Um, folders, folders, folders. And, um, and I still have, you know, like boxes of actual paper files um, out there with all these scientific papers. And I would second what Bryn says about trying to keep your footnotes in order, because if you don't, it'll just be a horrible mess at the end. Can we all I couldn't hear. That. I think the I think the room might probably picked it up, but the question was: Is there any software that you use to uh, to help organize things? And when I was talking about organizing, I was thinking in terms of physically organizing your notes and everything and research, but also just wrapping your head around the scale of a project like this. In terms of how do you prioritize your reporting, your reporting trips, and where you're going to you know dive into writing your book? Do you start at the introduction and write all the way to the end? Start at chapter one, write the introduction last. Do you you know where do you start? Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't addressed this question yet, so I can go. Um, as far as organizing goes, I did use a piece of software called Zotero pretty much just to organize my endnotes. I just used it to make formatting and, and organizing my endnotes and keeping them linked in the right places easier. And I did, I did do that right from the start and would strongly recommend that. And as far as organizing my research, I also just had files on my computer. I had one for each chapter and then in there would go any like PDFs of papers that I downloaded that went with that chapter and recordings of any interviews that I had done. And that was, that was pretty much it. And my publisher also, as soon as I had signed, asked me to put together a timeline of how I was going, how I proposed to progress through writing the manuscript and finish it on time, maybe because I'm a first time author. And so I just decided, all right, I'm gonna give myself this number of weeks for each chapter, I was, someone just said, what was that software again, Zotero? Uh, so I decided I'm just gonna give myself this number of weeks for each chapter and I'll leave myself some this number of weeks of buffer at the end and just plowed through 
chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, I did write it all in order, except that I left the introduction for last and then came back to that. As far as balancing it with paid work goes, I was starting from zero in terms of paid work because I left my full-time job at the start of the pandemic. As I, as I mentioned, um, my son was two years old then, and I also was diagnosed with cancer right around the same time. And pandemic childcare, cancer, full-time work, one thing had to go and it was full-time job. So writing my book proposal was my side project while being a stay-at-home mom and doing chemo. And then once that was all behind me and I had sold the book, I did gradually build up a few side clients who I still have to kind of do other things to fill the time when I wasn't writing the book and bring in some extra money. But the book was kind of my main project from the moment that I started it. Well, like I said earlier, the only way I could think about it was in terms of discrete um, pieces. I knew, I knew that there had been this incredible burst of discovery around um, earthquake risk in the Pacific Northwest. And I knew a lot of the players. So I knew that I wanted to treat it uh, as much as a narrative as I could. And there were, there were a lot of kind of good natural stories there in the material, just in the way that it unfolded and the people involved. So wherever possible, um, I tried to to make it as continuous a story as possible. There, there, there were sections, you know, where I just had to plop in, you know, stuff on this, stuff on buildings, you know, and that, and that kind of thing. But, um, but I, it's incredibly helpful if you feel like you have a true story to tell. I don't have much to add on this point, other than to say that with books, much more so than with magazine articles, you have the opportunity to put in informative artwork my first book was called Mapping Human History, and it was full of maps. My second book was about a math competition and actually had the, the equations these kids were trying to solve in the book. And, you, and, and the last one had a, a variety of photographs. So oddly enough, that artwork can help you organize the narrative arc and your thoughts in getting that book done. Some books don't have any artwork, but mine always have. And it's been a great help for me to think in terms of writing around the art that's in there. Um, my book doesn't have any art in it, and the publisher specifically did not want it, and because it just, I guess, for, for their style, um, they just wanted the, the narrative. Um, one of the things that helped me um, stop panicking <laughs> when I was starting on the project was not only thinking about sort of the discrete chapters, which really helped, you know, one step at a time, but also kind of like thinking about the year, you know, some of the uh, things that I was doing involved gardening and farming. So, um, you know, thinking about um, are there particular meetings, you know, that are coming up and, and with COVID, one of the advantages is that you're able to attend more virtually, you know, uh, that so in, in some ways, there's a little bit more accessibility, you know, to some of the, some of the meetings. So, so part of it was just kind of planning out the calendar, are there specific things that I need to be thinking about, you know, wanting to talk to uh, a farmer, for example, and so obviously that needs to be during the growing season, right. Um, so there were certain things like that. And then uh, I also then decided to tackle what I thought would be the hardest chapters. Uh, just to feel like I was making progress. Uh, but in terms of, of having my editor read it, she wanted to read it in chunks from beginning to end. So my book is in three sections. And so, you know, once I kind of got a, a grip on some of the harder parts of the book, then we did go kind of in order of, uh, and we had started with 14 chapters, we dropped two, which was a very good decision on her part uh, because I was a little over ambitious. Um, so we ended up with 12 chapters. And so we did kind of like on a rolling basis, uh, but, but it was for her, she wanted multiple chapters at once. Um, so we did four and then six, eight, 12. Rebecca, did you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, I think I already addressed it. I, I wrote it in order from beginning to end, except for the introduction. And I actually sent, some people do bigger chunks. I was sending each chapter to my to my editor as I completed it, just to make sure that I was on the right track. 
great. And I just wanted to thank you so much for sharing your experience because I think that was uh, that must have been tremendously hard, but it's also a, a sort of a great example of if someone is feeling like, oh, I just can't get up today to write my book. It's like there are a lot of other things that that could be happening in the background. Oh, don't, hold, don't hold me up as an example, but <laughs> well, true. Sorry. So one of the things I do want to talk is about uh, putting yourself in the book. Mm. You're all writers. You're all journalists. You're all, you know, dispassionate at some level. You're trained not to use the word I. Is it difficult to put yourself in the book? What was your experience with that? And uh, what advice would you give to other people? Start with Bryn. Um. Yeah, but both my agent and my editor um, really kept hammering away at me to put more of myself in the book, uh, which I resisted at first. But then one of the chapters I'm, I'm, I'm essentially experimenting, experimenting on myself. So I did, you know, daily tracker apps. I was taking fiber and supplements. I had my microbiome sequenced. Um, and I think that was a little freeing because then I thought, oh, well, this is really interesting. You know, this kind of curiosity about what I was doing. And that extended into kind of gardening, you know, so, so we had this kind of pandemic gardening project, which uh, ended up being part of the book. Um, and I think, you know, she, my editor would sort of zero in on the parts where, you know, I had inserted myself and say, yes, more of that, this. And, and so initially it was, it was a struggle because you're right, we're trained to not be part of the story, but in a book uh, to help readers relate, there, there really is, uh, at least, you know, in, in, in the case of poop, <laughs> how do you, how do you sort of like personalize it and how do you talk about it in a way that's going to resonate with people, right, which is a challenge, uh, but there are ways to do it and, and yeah, I think I appreciate now um, that they push me to, to really put more, more of myself in it. Uh, I tend not to do it very much, but I just realized sitting here that I'm actually pop up in each one of those five books at, at one time or another, just as often it just didn't fleeting. So now we'll ask the journalist if she shows up in her book. Well, for the, the earthquake book, I wrote it as if <clears throat> it was a newspaper story. So I wasn't in it at all. And <clears throat> in retrospect, I, I think that was a mistake. It, it was a, makes it a little more stilted. Um, you know, just the ability to say, you know, he told me, he showed me. It's like, you know, you're there, but you're not, you know, necessarily, the book isn't necessarily about you, but, you know, this pretending that you're not there at all is kind of stupid. <laughs> and so I wish I hadn't done that with the midwifery book. It was more like, you know, I was there as an observer, but not really an important part of the book. Rebecca. I am, although I've sort of wandered into it at this point, I am not a, a trained journalist. I have a science background, but my, my writing experience is all self-taught. So I have a little bit of a difference entry into this field and it, it feels like another lifetime, but actually the first sort of writing that I did regularly was for years back when blogs were still a thing and I was working in outdoor education. I wrote a natural history blog about the nature of the places I was living. And of course that was all first person narrative. That's what blogs are. And so this comes very naturally to me. It was a little bit funny um, in my book proposal in sort of the section summarizing what I would write about in the conclusion, I had mentioned the whole the whole cancer thing and, and birds being a source of hope during that time. And my agent said, she didn't, she did not make me do a lot of editing in my proposal, but she said, take that out because not all, not all publishers are gonna want that, take that out. And then if you have an editor who likes it, then you can put it back in. Um, but my editor actually ended up similar to the, what else has been mentioned, whenever I didn't sort of insert myself as a character saying, oh, this is great to hear of this. So I do pop up in my book quite a bit as the, the narrator of my own experiences going into the field with scientists and whatnot. And one of the chapters talks about what, one of the ways that they used to measure bird migration was by watching the face of the full moon and counting the silhouettes of birds flying across it. So I actually borrowed a telescope and set it up in my driveway and gave it a try looking, looking at the full moon during migration to describe what that was like. And so I I pop up in my book a fair bit. Great. So during the book book writing process, uh, you have to support yourself, obviously. Some of you are working. Some of you are working less than you did. We talked a little bit about getting fellowships. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the Sloan Foundation is kind of the, the big one that most people identify. Are there other ones that are out there, maybe some obscure ones that you 
applied for, didn't get, didn't apply for, but have heard about since. What's your uh, experience there? Rebecca, do you want to start? I, I don't really have anything to add to this one, I'm afraid. I haven't done any applying for fellowships. I Because I received a large advance and I have a spouse who works full time, I, I, it wasn't really an issue for me. Yes, I, I think there are sources of funds out there. I, I think occasionally, too, for the right kind of writer, a retreat, of which there are many, in, including here in Washington State, is a good place to go, be surrounded by other writers. But at the same time, a lot of those retreats, they give you eight or 10 hours to sit there and write. And you're expected to do that uh, before showing up for dinner in the evening. So I, I think those kinds of opportunities could work as well. I I don't have a lot to add. Um, I think it was a, a, an unusual circumstance during the pandemic, but a lot of like the fellowships actually took a hiatus. Um, so there actually were a lot that would have been available. And they said, yeah, um, maybe in, you know, 2022. Um, so I, you know, I applied for um, a couple of grants. Um, I didn't get them, but I think there are a lot of fellowships out there and I think they found ways now of restarting. So I would encourage people to look at it. I think it was just an unusual circumstance where, you know, probably half of the fellowships that I looked at were discontinued for, for a year. Oh, I, um, I can I can follow up if people are interested. But, uh, I, there were a couple of sites. I mean, it was a lot of Google search, Google searches uh, to try and find. You know, I think I was interested in um, like writing retreats, for example. Um, that would just give me kind of the space to do that, and um, I really couldn't find any of them that would work for the timeline that I had. Yeah. So in the writing process, did you guys find that you were writing a different book than the proposal that you initially submitted? And if so, does that even matter? Well, let's start with Rebecca. <laughs> um, in the big picture, no. Like the, the nine chapters that were in my proposal were the nine chapters that I wrote. Um, but in the smaller details, yes, I think if I were to go back to my proposal and look at kind of what stories and what researchers I thought I was going to use to kind of illustrate what I wanted to get across in each of those chapters, I think that changed dramatically. Because, and, and that might have been partly because I was a novice writer and I didn't do as much research up front as I possibly should have. I might be very lucky and it all worked out in the end. But I felt like each time I would start to work on a new chapter, even though I had obviously done some research on it for the proposal, as soon as I started doing a lot more reading on it, I would discover stories that I hadn't known about when I was writing the proposal and researchers who I hadn't known about and would end up deciding to go in a different direction. So no, no in the big picture, but yes, very much in the, in the, in the little picture, if that makes sense. Does anybody else want to address that? I had an interesting experience with this last book in that when I turned in the manuscript, my editor said, wow, this book has too much science in it. And I said, well, uh, but it's all right there in the proposal. This is this is exactly the book that I proposed. And that was an important negotiating point as we uh, compromised on how much science was going to go in the book. Well, one, one good thing about not having um written a proposal and just being told to write a book about midwifery, for example. I, you know, I looked at some of the other books in the series, so I got a sense of what they were um, interested in and, and, how, and how they were structured. But I learned a lot about midwifery. And as new things came up, I was able to incorporate them, um, even though I hadn't, you know, discussed it with the editor. So, for example, I found out that a lot of midwives uh, train and then go work internationally in places like refugee camps and, you know, very traumatic situations um, with, with women, you know, under, under very bad conditions. And so I, I added a, a person who exemplified that in a section on that. I think one of the changes um, that I mentioned a little bit was, you know, and in, in putting myself in the book more, um, but I think the analogy that really helped me was thinking of myself as a tour guide and that you're basically taking readers by the hand and saying, trust me, I'm going to lead you through this really interesting journey and realizing that you don't, 
you're not writing an encyclopedia of, you know, because I was, I was kind of terrified at first that, you know, I was going to leave out something major. Um, and that can be paralyzing. And I think I finally realized, no, you know, you can just read them, lead them on an interesting journey. And if there's something they're really interested in, they can always learn more about it. Right. Um, so that was, that was a nice way for me to kind of think about not only how I was portraying myself in the book, but then also how I was connecting the book together. Um, you know, I'm this tour guide and I'm taking you somewhere. Um, you know, trust me, follow me. Um, and in doing that, uh, we uh, got rid of a couple chapters because they just were not strong enough. And we took the best parts of them and kind of incorporated them in other places. We added a stronger beginning to kind of set the, 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 the base. So, uh, you know, and some of the, the specific examples changed, um, which is, I think, par for the course. You know, you, some of them aren't as strong as you initially thought. And then during your course of reporting, you'll find something that really excites you. Um, and, and, you know, my editor was really excited about that, that kind of the discovery process. And I think that kind of can, comes through as well, like, oh, you know, look what I found. <laughs> um, so yeah, fortunately, they're flexible enough. I think a lot of, of editors are, you know, to a to a to a point. But you know, in this case, it was it was a good thing. Great, we could go on all night. We're running short on time, but I'm going to go to a couple of questions in the audience here. Go ahead. I, I can repeat it. Yeah, I was just wondering on that point, Brand Lake. What level of change do you feel like you would need to run by your editor for you to change it? Like if you're getting away from your original proposal? So the question is, what level of uh, buy-in do you need from an editor if you're really veering far away from your original proposal? Uh, that's a good question. I think Editors don't want to be surprised in a bad way, right? Um, so if there is a pretty major uh, through line that is starting to fall apart, uh, if one of your central characters, you know, there's, you know, something that's seeming not right, uh, they want to know about it. Um, you know, fortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, but there are a couple times where I would say, you know, I really, I really want to you know have this in this chapter i'm not quite sure that it's gonna work out uh but you know i want you to know about it so i think just like making keeping them in the loop you know whether it's just regular emails or um you know we would have regular zoom discussions um but i think that's that's the one key thing is don't no no bad surprises <laughs> and 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 you can it you can be quite flexible, you know. I, I I don't know what percentage my book was different from the initial proposal, but you know, even the even in the chapter that I had already written, uh, that was probably like 40, 50 percent different by the time I was done with it this time around. So it changed quite a bit. Um yeah, I don't I don't think I made any big enough changes that would have really thrown off or offended my editors. And as I mentioned, I was sending each chapter that I, each chapter to them as I completed it and having a Zoom call with them so they kind of could see whether I was sufficiently staying on track. And I think since the structure didn't change, I didn't want to add a chapter or leave out a chapter or change anything major. My experience was that they didn't really care that much if the specific characters and examples that I was talking about were the ones that were in my proposal, as long as they were good and interesting. Great. Okay. I want to compress a couple of questions here in the interest of time to talk a little bit more about the editing process. Um, first of all, when do you hire fact checkers, sensitivity readers, any of those kinds of uh, external factors? Obviously, that comes out of your advance, right? And then uh, just talk about your, um, probably talk about a story that you love that didn't make it in the book and how you decided to exclude it. I can't, I can't address this because I never hired fact checkers and there's, uh, there's much less fact checking of books than is done at major magazines. And so uh, you just have to rely upon yourself to get the fact checking right. Um, I hired three fact checkers um, and that all came out of my advance and that was 14,000. 
Um, so it's a big investment. Um, I thought it was absolutely essential for what I was doing. Uh, there's a lot of research in it and um, they were worth it. I mean, they were fantastic and they saved me. So yeah, so it's, and, and, and again, I think it depends on what the book is, but for me, it, it was uh, essential, but it was also something that I had to kind of keep reminding my editor about because I think publishers still don't really have a great idea of how it should be integrated. And it was a process that took three months. And that's, uh, by the end, I was sort of panicking. I had one main fact checker and I hired the two others because it was clear we weren't gonna be done in time for when my, you know, when I had to have it finished. So there was a month where I was panicked. Um, and fortunately I was able to find two other fact checkers to split the last four chapters. Um, and, and they were terrific. but. That's something that I think the, the publishing world needs to do a better job of just, you know, recognizing the importance of that and, and you know, paying for it <laughs> in a way. They paid, they paid for um, a legal review. Uh, we did not have a sensitivity reader, uh, but the fact checkers, as part of what they did, actually all, also offered some sensitivity um, editing as well, you know, so certain suggestions that they had, which were really good. So that was kind of incorporated a little bit into the fact checking process. I did not work with a fact checker or anyone like that. Um, if I am lucky enough to write a second book, I would like to, but as was just mentioned, it's not really... Not only do you have to pay for it yourself, but there's not really a natural point where it kind of fits into the publisher's flow for the timeline that they want to be on and when they want things from you. So it's it's definitely a, an extra lift for the author. And I did not do it this time, although I would be interested in it. I, as I mentioned earlier, I got very little editing. Um, but the one thing that was surprising was with the midwifery book, since it was a major publisher, they did hire a lawyer to go through it. And I probably had more conversations with her than I had with my editor. And she was very careful because she didn't want them to get sued. It was, it was really uh, illuminating the things that she zeroed in on. Great. Well, we're running very low on time, but I want to compress uh, a couple of more areas. One of the things I want to do, uh, do want to talk about is promoting the book. Um, you're not a writer or a salesperson. Social media and digital promotion, book tours, whether they're virtual or in a bookstore, TVs, podcasts, op-eds, excerpts, pitfalls, and pluses. What is your experience with book promotion? And I think I want to start with you, Rebecca. Um, so I am a pretty, pretty active Twitter user, and I think that, and I was prior to writing a book, and I think that actually contributed a lot and helped a lot. Um, not only have I has it been helpful? I think just for, I don't have a huge Twitter following or anything, but I think for promoting it and getting it out there, but also just for connecting with sources. Like when I started trying to figure out what projects I might go in the field for, I literally just put on Twitter, like who are the ornithologists who are working with these techniques in the next year and got tons of responses and was able to figure out, you know, kind of fill up my calendar with research trips. And I, even when I was writing the proposal, I tweeted a lot about what I was working on. It wasn't a secret project or anything. And that's how I had acquisitions editors at small presses like DMing me saying, hey, I'd love to see the proposal when it's done. So that was that I think has been a huge plus. Um, and I've, I've, I've dabbled on Instagram and mailing lists, email lists as well, but Twitter has really been invaluable for my whole book process. Does anybody else want to add that? I only occasionally enjoy promoting a book, but just in case we don't get to this topic, uh, we've made book book writing and the publishing process sound fairly onerous and thankless. And that's not at all true. Uh, book writing is really some of the most satisfying writing that I have ever done. And it's, and, and you, and, and people have different reasons for writing a book. I think some people really like to get out there and promote them. And I will do that to try to promote that book. But being able to go into a library and having your book sitting there on the shelves as something that people can, can acquire for decades, really, and having it be the go-to source uh, of a particular, you know, all, all of us have written now books that if people want to know about earthquakes or they want to know about uh, uh, flushing, um, 
they will go to those books. And that's something you don't get from a magazine article. So that's just a, a, an expansion of the promotion question. You haven't, you haven't started promoting. I, I, I'm just starting to uh, promote. I mean, I, I feel a little bit fortunate that uh, there is a, a, a publicist and a marketing uh, person at the uh, uh, publisher who is working with me. Um, and so I'm still, I'm still not quite sure exactly how that's going to, the, what, what, what that's going to take, but I would say don't overlook other things like LinkedIn. I mean, I was kind of shocked at the engagement that I got on just kind of, uh, you know, posting about it there um, because you also can then link up with uh, various organizations. You know, obviously there's uh, a lot of, of, uh, sanitation work, you know, so a lot of uh, organizations working in that sphere. And so they will um, oftentimes help you promote your book because they're interested in it. And, you know, if that's something they think their audiences want to, to hear about, uh, you know, I've gotten really good engagement from some of those organizations. So, so that can be another way to kind of help you. What the, on the point that Steve made about how satisfying it is to have a, a book out there just to see your name on it, I would say I really agree with that, particularly with the book about earthquakes. And I have become kind of the go to person uh, for radio interviews, for, for television interviews. Um, so that, you know, kind of in, indirectly raised the profile of the book. And then I also, um, you know, this kind of interesting little side gig in giving talks was a result of of this book and at first I did them all for free because I didn't think you could charge and then it's like oh hey I could get paid for this um and I never got paid a lot but um but but I got paid and you know for probably about two or three years I was kind of in demand as a speaker and it was really fun and just one, one other thing I want to say about writing a book as opposed to writing an article, um, like I said earlier, it's always frustrating when, you know, you're constrained by space. And so one of the joys of writing a book is the ability to just go off on tangents. As long as they're interesting, uh, you, you can follow that and you can include it. And that's really sweet. We didn't plan that, honestly, but that was a perfect segue to my final question, which is, what brings you the most joy in writing a book? So I'm not going to ask Sandy, but I'll start with you, Rebecca. Um, at least with the specific book that I've just finished writing, what brought me the most joy was all of the fascinating people that I got to connect with. Um, I talked to a lot of ornithologists in their 80s, uh, and I felt very, who were probably not going to be with us for very much longer. And I kind of felt at a lot of points like I was assembling an oral history of a really cool and underappreciated little niche within science, talking to some people who aren't gonna be around for very much longer to, to share their stories. And so that felt like a privilege. There's the, the guy who basically invented wildlife radio telemetry is still alive and he's about 90 years old. He lives in Illinois. I've been to his house. He is such a character. And so definitely for me, the, the, my favorite part was just connecting with all of these really fascinating people who've done some really cool things in science in the last 50 years. I, I would echo that. I mean, I think people were so delighted that I wanted to hear what they were working on. You know, I would go to these wastewater treatment plants and they were, you know, they would be like, no one ever comes here. And they, but they would just keep showing me cool things that they were working on because they really uh, are doing all of these innovative things to try and, you know, uh, recycle and reduce as much as they can. And so there was a lot of really unexpected innovation that was happening there. So I think I was really delighted about how often I was surprised or I thought I knew something and it was just completely different. So that kind of, that continual surprise for me was was just it was great you know because I've always been a really curious person and wanting to know why and then you know always thinking that something worked one way and finding out that it's completely different um, and learning that from people who were just so delighted to talk to me yeah was it was great and and for me one of the greatest of many satisfactions was the ability to really dig deeply into a subject with magazine stories you never feel like you're, you're getting to deal with the fundamentals of that story, or you really understand it inside and out. I always compare the experience of writing a book 
in my own mind, I guess, not to other people. I don't know if I've ever said this before to, to getting a PhD, to doing a PhD program. You work on it for three or four years. And the great thing about books is that once you're done, you don't have to work in that field for the rest of your life. Like you do with a PhD, you actually get to go out and, and do a whole nother PhD. So it's, uh, it's really fun. Great, I just took a quick look at the q and I think we've covered almost all the questions. So I'd just like to thank our panelists so much for uh, sharing all of their wisdom with us tonight. And thank you all for tuning in and, uh, and joining us. And for those of you in the room, I'm sorry that it's 90 degrees, but you know, summer has arrived in Seattle and that's just what happens. So I'd love to thank uh, the Northeastern University as well for hosting us. They were very kind to, uh, to donate the space this evening. So everyone have a great night, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to sign off for the night now, but thank you so much, everyone.